Hi, everybody. Welcome to Book Passage, um, our author conversation for today. My name is Allison Bainbridge, and I am looking so forward to this discussion today in honor of the novel, Just By Looking At Him. Um, during this month celebrating Pride, we're hearing from people who are sharing their experiences in so many forms, art, film, lectures, uh, and literature. As someone who has worked in the book world for over seven years, it makes me so proud that there's so many more books, um, voices that are offering perspectives from BIPOC and people who are differently abled and queer, trans, and everything in between. Um, tonight, tonight, we're going to hear from author Ryan O'Connell. He is the star of Peacock's Queer as Folk and the Netflix series special, and he has written a darkly witty and touching novel following a gay TV writer with cerebral palsy as he fights addiction and searches for acceptance in an overwhelmingly ableist world. After falling down a rabbit hole of sex drinking and Hollywood backstabbing, Elliot decides to limp his way towards redemption, but faces Facing your demons is easier said than done. Um, just by looking at him is a really incisive commentary on gay life. It's a heart-centered, laugh-out-loud exploration of self and a rare insight into life as a person with disabilities. It's candid, biting, and refreshingly real. Um, Ryan O'Connell is the Emmy-nominated creator, writer, and star of Netflix. Netflix is special, which is based on his memoir, I'm Special, and Other Lies We Tell Ourselves. He's also <laughs> written for other TV shows like Will and Grace, Awkward, and Peacock's Queer as Folk Revival, which he also stars in. He lives, laughs, and loves in Los Angeles with his partner, Jonathan Parks Ramage. We're also so fortunate to have Carly Ciotino, I'm not saying that right, Ciotino. Um, in conversation with Ryan, Carly is a TV writer, the creator and host of Slut Ever and a sex and relationships columnist for Vogue magazine. I want to give you both a warm welcome. Thank you so much. Hi. Hi. Hi, Carly. Hey, Ryan. How's it going? Oh my God, it's nice going good. How are you? Oh my God, it's so good to see you in this totally organic setting. Oh my God. I know. Amazing. You look better than ever. <laughs> Is it the oh, no, so not. <laughs> uh, yeah, it is. I have that COVID glow. Maybe it's, warmer than, maybe it's COVID day nine. Um, okay, I'm going to start us off with uh, no lube. Just go right into full penetration. I'm going to do a little a reading, a reading section, because I, I learned how to read just for this book. And so I really want to utilize that. Um, okay, so this, just to give you some context, this is when uh, the character of Elliot uh, goes and meets his sex worker for the first time. I took a quick shower and attempted to clean my asshole in a case a rim job was in the cards. I love rim jobs, giving and receiving them, but I hadn't had one in years because Gus hates them. He says they're too dirty and he's afraid he'll lack up a speck of shit or something, but I'm like, yeah, hello. Welcome to the world of ass play. Okay, sometimes there's shit. Also, gay guys only have like three things to choose from on the sex menu, okay? You can't afford to cross one off. After doing a deep clean, I removed my finger and sniffed it, satisfied. I found River's Instagram, his handle, a river runs through you, and did a deep dive in the Uber to his house. His content was pretty typical of an Instagay. Workout videos, a photo in a Speedo with a long caption about his struggles with anxiety, at the dentist for teeth whitening spawn con. I clicked on the dentist who was also hot and gay. It never ends. Then I came across a photo of him with Zach on a sailboat. These sailboats. Ugh. Of course he's friends with Zach. Zach is a popular daddy influencer with no apparent job other than be extremely handsome and post photos to make other less handsome men feel bad about themselves. I think he occasionally builds furniture that he only sells to other dreamy gay men. Ugh, whatever. Anyway, he and his gay posse all live in Santa Monica, which is the first sign of being unwell. And they have this sailboat that they take out every Sunday and do poppers and get naked and like stare at the endless expanse of blue laid out before them and try to realize stuff. I want to fuck Zach very badly. It's in the top 10 of things I hate about myself. This one time at a party, he took my hand and without a word led me to his car, a Jeep, which is impractical, but okay, run me over with it. I was confused as to what his intentions were. Was he going to rob me? And if so, could we at least have sex first? But instead he played me this song by Tennis, which is an indie band that likes to ride around in a sailboat. I swear to God, all paths lead back to sailboats and sang all the lyrics to me. He grabbed my shirt the entire time, building his fucking heart out. I may or may not have gotten middle school hard. When the song ended, I was convinced we were going to make out, but he simply said, cool song, huh? 
and got out of his stupid, sexy Jeep. I sat alone in the car, my face all hot with humiliation, thinking, I'll never get to step foot on that fucking sailboat. I'll never be invited because of my subpar bone structure and because I'm not disciplined enough to not eat pasta and my stomach is soft because I work out mostly for mental health reasons and don't hate myself enough to shrink my world in order to shrink my size because I have a limp in scars and slightly yellow teeth that could never score teeth whitening spawn con because they will talk about things I've never experienced, never had access to. And what would be the point? I have nothing to offer them besides a well-observed joke. I would like for these sailboat gates to see me how I see them as a body. If Zach saw me like that, he would have stayed in the car with me. He would have taken off my clothes, regarded me as a series of parts to use and enjoy. It would have meant so much to be seen for so little. And maybe that's why I looked up River that day. The potential to be seen as just a body. Gus can't see me like that. He's too close. He thinks my body is crazy nice and that I look like Clark Kent. But he has long-term relationships goggles on. He didn't even care when I gained 10 pounds one winter, which I know I should have processed as, wow, my man is so sweet. He loves me for me. But instead I thought, ugh, unconditional love, disgusting. Your opinion is no longer reliable. <laughs> it's funny. All I ever dreamed of was finding a man who would love me for me, flaws, disability, and all. Now that I had it, I found it revolting. After all these years with Gus, I wanted an unbiased person to see my body, to take it in, to examine it, not knowing or caring what kind of brain it was attached to. All right. We got rim jobs. <laughs> we got we got sailboats. You know what I mean? We got we got tennis. Self-hatred. Love it. Totally. But like make self-hatred, but like make it lol. Oh, exactly. <laughs> um, your book is so funny, Ryan. I mean, I've been holding off talking about it with you personally because I was trying to like save it for the pod or whatever people say. But like yeah. <laughs> I I loved it so much. It's so funny and it's so sweet and loving. Oh, thank you. Well, you read early drafts of it. I sent you early drafts. Remember that? Yeah. So this was like height of COVID, right? When we were truly in lockdown. And I remember I was walking, we talked on the phone a lot. I would walk my dog outside and it was when people wore masks like in the park because we didn't know. (laughs) And um, I was doing nothing and you were writing a thousand words a day. You would... (laughs) send them to me and yeah I was reading them and I just thought that they were so funny I feel like it's like you kept me going you kept me going because I would be like I wasn't sure what I was doing was good and I would write a thousand words a day not knowing that I had a novel like I had no idea but like I remember I would send them to you and I would be like okay what do you think because I feel like number one I trust your taste like beyond anyone else and number two, I feel like you and I have very similar sensibilities. So I feel like I could like trust you to like say like if it wasn't good or not, because it was just like, it was just like me writing a thousand words a day on my computer. Like it wasn't that deep. You know what I mean? But like, I remember you were like, keep writing, keep sending me these things. I want to know what happens. I want to know what happens. And I feel like it, it really kept me going to finish the book or what I didn't realize was a book, but you know, keep writing every day. Yeah, I loved it. I mean, I was honored that you sent it to me. I think, uh, I feel like it's the most you thing you've ever read. And I feel like for me, it's the most cliche, cliche, cliche thing ever to say, but I process my life through writing. And sometimes I don't know what I think and don't know what I feel until I write it down and edit it and edit it and edit it. Yes. And it felt like you were going through maybe that similar process. Oh, I mean, absolutely. I feel like, like you, I don't, sometimes I feel like I don't give myself permission to feel things until I write about them. Like, I clearly, the way I came about this book, wrote this book, because, you know, I wrote a memoir, LOL, when I was 26, truly so sad, so trash. And it took me like two and a half years to write it. And two and a half years, honey, it's literally a pamphlet at Urban Outfitters. Like, it's like literally 40 pages long. So like, (laughs) we're, we're averaging a page a year. And this book, by contrast, maybe because I I did it just doing a thousand words a day. So I mentally, I was not setting out to write a book, which I think allowed me to write a book because I wasn't like crushed on the enormity of it all. But even that notwithstanding, like the, the, the process of writing this book was so pleasurable and so joyful. And it truly did pour out of me in such a cliche way where I'm like, it, it just felt like um, I've never had such a creative experience void of pain or frustration it was very obvious that I had a lot of things to work through and a lot of things to get off my chest and this book really became the pathway for that 
which is like, it's, it's as a writer, it's like, you kind of hope for those experiences, but it's very rare that you get them. And I think probably because of the, the confines of the pandemic, I was really forced to examine a lot of my issues in a way that I probably wouldn't have if we were just like lollygagging about, you know what I mean? It, yeah. Oh my God, this lighting is getting so moody. Sorry. Okay. It's um, getting so moody. It's very new rave. No, yeah. I, uh, yeah, no, that, that truly makes me hate you because whenever mm -hmm. people say, whenever writers say they like, enjoy writing and things just poured out of them, I'm like, either you're lying or you're psychotic. Like, I just don't think I've ever had that experience. You've never had that? Like, even with like a blog post or something, you've never had that? I think that with blog posts I did, maybe because I was like on drugs at that time. So I didn't care. And but also when the Adderall hits. Yeah. yeah. No, I yeah. was on like, okay, let's just like yeah, yeah. no punctuation. Yeah. Just expression. <laughs> no, like, but I think being less precious about something, right. And you, you, the feeling of like, oh, this doesn't, this isn't really anything. Is it a book maybe, but who cares? I think like that lack of preciousness is really important. I mean, I, um, I got this really great advice from Kat Marnell, which makes me feel cool. Incredible. So, okay. I Love. So Love. I was starting to write my book. This was like in 2018 or something. I wrote a book too. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> it was hard and long. And so we had the same hairdresser and I would see her in the hairdresser a lot. And I was having such anxiety writer's block, not being able to write anything. And she was like, here's what you do. You wake up every morning before you get out of bed, you write 300 words and they can be like totally crap and you don't read them back, but you just do 300. And then by the end of the week, you've like got a couple thousand words, you know, like yeah, you're writing from something rather than writing from nothing, which I think is, is the most terrifying thing. Is what Was it hard for you? Did you, did, is that kind of what you did to make, to write your book? Was that sort of like the process you went for that? Yeah. I, and I, I did that and it was helpful because I think it's like, it's easier to start editing than it is to start writing. So I think like, basically what I'm saying is like, you just kind of spitting this out without feeling like it had to be something. Yeah, no, I mean, I wasn't sure anyone was going to read this. I mean, I wasn't, it was not, it was for me. It was really, truly for me. And I think that really helped. But also I feel like with memoir, you're, you have this annoying allegiance to the truth. You know what I mean? And so you have to work within the confines of what actually happened to you. And I think, Sometimes that would be paralyzing for me was to like actually get it right or, you know what I mean? And I think the, the freedom of fiction was sort of like, I could be almost more, way more honest than I ever could be in memoir. I mean, like it was, it was crazy. I mean, I just felt, and I think in a weird way, this book is more personal than my first book. Absolutely. Uh, because I didn't have to actually tell a story that truly happened, but emotionally I could be as honest as I wanted to be without judgment. Do you know what I mean? Mm hmm for sure um we were like it's me but like when he does something bad you're like that's not me um, well well I would say it's it's emotionally autobiographical but it's fiction the story is fiction but yeah like okay so let's talk about the book um because I read it and uh, <laughs> and okay so speaking of just in terms of it being like emotionally honest so one yeah. of my favorite lines of the book which I wrote down um it's one of my favorite lines in almost anything is this. Oh. So he's that's Elliot, the main character, is talking about like one of the first times having sex with his boyfriend. And he said, the sex that weekend was funny, sexy, awkward, familiar, strange, and never boring. And I feel like I when I read that, I was like, that is one of the most accurate and best descriptions of sex I've ever heard. Because yeah. I feel like the kind of like the ex explanation of sex or to notice that it's funny and awkward, but to say it in a way where those things aren't negatives. No. Any of it strange and familiar. Like, I think I was like, that's what sex is actually like. And I feel like people are terrified that that's true. Does that make yeah, sense? Yeah, no, of course. And I think the emphasis there also is that it's never boring because I think we as humans are really trained to desire newness. I think above all, we like newness. So even when, you know, even when I'm sleeping with someone new, like even if it's bad, it doesn't really matter because it's new and that you can, honey, you can coast on new for a lot of things. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Because it's sort of like, oh, this is a new experience. Like I've never, I've never seen this person in this way. So the novelty really carries a lot of the weight. 
So it being good or bad is sort of besides the point. You know what I mean? The fact that you're just with this person that you've never seen in this way is enough. You know what I mean? And I think um, it's so funny because in the beginning, you never, ever think you'll ever get bored of fucking this person. You are convinced (laughs) that you will be the exception to the rule that like everyone else is trash and like trapped in heteronormative prisons and like you're the one that broke free and like da 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 but it is so interesting how sex changes in the con- like within the confines of a relationship. And I think, I mean, the the relationship in the novel is much more like kind of doomed to fail for reasons that are sort of beyond sex, but also some part of it because I think Elliot is contorting himself to for Gus's pleasure, unbeknownst to Gus. But I think he's still, you know, trying to make his body seem, as it says in the book, erotic rather than a nuisance. So in that way, it's sort of doomed to fail in that way but I do think you know those feelings of being in a long-term relationship and having to navigate how you could love someone so much but that your desire for them is shifting that is a mind fuck like that's sort of like it's just it's they the two things run counter and you're it's hard to make sense of it without feeling guilt or shame you know what I mean for sure like one of the things I I thought of over and over when I was reading it is there's this whole, like Esther Perel talks about this a lot with this Mm. idea of like, why do happy people cheat? Why do people in loving relationships cheat? And the thing that feels so accurate is when, when people in loving relationships cheat, they're not looking for another person. They're looking for another self. Yes. And I was like, oh my God, that is so true. Yeah, and also, by the way, it's like also just like not that deep. I mean, it's like, do you know what I mean? It's like, <laughs> like it's so it's like weird. It's like people think of like cheating as this sort of like huge indictment on the partner, and you're not getting your needs met, et cetera, et cetera. It's like, well, what about the idea that maybe one person shouldn't be able to give you everything you need? What about that concept being a fallacy? You know what I mean? Like, I don't. I think that's again. I think that's very like first draft heterosexual vibes. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Well, I think that also going back to what you said earlier, it's about, it's about not only experiencing someone new, but feeling new in the eyes of a different person. And I think oh that's my God, like, yeah. like, like another self where it's like, I love myself with my partner, partners mm-hmm. or whatever. Um, and <laughs> partners I, for the poly contingent, we, yeah, hear exactly. you, we celebrate you. you yeah. yeah, yeah so yeah. it's like, you know, my partner sees a part of me that like other people don't see a part that's like a deeply intimate, maybe sillier, or maybe more, more embarrassing version. That's like in a nice way. Yeah. Like you want, it's like, sometimes I don't want to be a whole person with a past and baggage and complexities. Like I just want to be objectified. And I feel like that's, this is what the character is going through in the book as well. And like, I feel like it can feel complicated to say that. Like, I want to be objectified because like, I think especially for women, it's like, that's bad. I know, totally. Well, it's so funny because I was talking about this earlier today too with somebody where it was like, yeah, like, all like for me as a disabled person you know I felt like you know the second I was born my dick was sawed off and then donated to charity and Mm -hmm. I feel like my whole lifelong mission is like finding my dick and then reattaching it to my body and because it's like all I want is some stranger in Arizona to comment on my Instagram sit on my face like I don't care about an Emmy I don't care about a TV show I don't care I just like want some random like Joe homo who like probably has like worms in his brains to be like you're hot like with like with like with the wrong form of your like y-o-u-r like not even <laughs> not even not even correct pronunciation but like to for him to not even use the wrong right form of your I'm like coming already do you know what I mean <laughs> yeah. um yeah it's just sort of like because this person on superficial level it's like and they're just saying like I want you for your body like to me there's no greater compliment which I know that for, historically for women that's been a different story and you know, blah, blah, blah. I'm just talking about from the POV of a disabled person. That is a huge, huge victory because we have been so historically desexualized. Do you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Right. So, it, but is, is there, is there a complicated feeling around it? Yeah. I mean, of course it's all complicated. Like it's like, it's not, <laughs> I mean, it's not like a thing I'm a proud to admit. Like I, I, I wish no. I didn't, I, I wish I didn't put so much value on it in my life because I know well, 
approach that? I don't know, actually. I, I, you know, I was going to say, I know that it doesn't really matter, but like, I think being objectified is important, especially if it's like, you know, you have the agency, you're the one driving the bus, the objectification bus, and you want people to get on. Like that to me feels empowering and great. And I think that is really incredibly meaningful. And I don't even know why I just tried to attach some value to that because like, it is important. It's important to me. And like, I don't think it should be embarrassing. You know what I mean? Given my history as a disabled person and like feeling like a Ken doll with my private parts, you know, singed off. No, completely. I think objectification when done, right? And when yeah. busted. Yeah, and exactly. Context, can be extremely hot. Yeah, like I don't always want to be like my brain. You know what I mean? Sometimes no, of course. Uh, yeah, well, but, but and I think the, I think the real defining difference is objectification on your terms you know what I mean it's like it's you're the one choosing to be objectified you're the one that wants this so it feels very consensual and I think I think that's obviously the biggest difference than like than some random guy on the street like catcalling you and like that you don't want to fuck and you're just like ew I'm just trying to get a bagel like go fuck yourself that that's a different kind of objectification that's not I always like welcome yeah. <laughs> um so oh, just- oh, oh, oh. Love. Me, honestly, me too. This one time, I, this one time I was walking with Hollywood and I was dressed like such a little slut and I was wearing like a backpack and like some guy pulled over and I'm pretty sure he thought I was an escort and like was like asking me like if I wanted to go somewhere and I being being mistaken for an escort, I felt like I had won an Oscar. I literally was <laughs> like, are you kidding me? I literally was like, I will, I'm like, who, me? Oh my God. I'm like, you would pay me to have, I'm like, okay, great. Like that was the biggest compliment ever. I loved it. I lived off that for months. (laughs) I didn't have to eat. I was just feasting on that anecdote for months. Um, So, okay. Speaking of sex workers. Yeah. uh, So, you know, like sex workers, um, play a big part in your book. The main character yeah. starts it sort of has like a becomes romantically obsessed with a sex worker he's seeing and then sees a variety of others along the way um, without giving too much away. But all you know, sex workers also played a part in your TV show special on Netflix. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And my question, my very deep question is like, what's the vibe? With okay, that. that's yeah, no, there's there's definitely a heavy vibe. There's a motif, <laughs> if you will. Um, I so I have never used a sex worker to have sex with me. Um, but I have used sex work uh for like erotic massage. So I've gone on like those websites like Rent Massore or whatever. Um, so you know, I've I've been in a lot of apartments with men, <laughs> and so I I'm very familiar with that kind of transactional dynamic. And I have found the experience to be pretty much overwhelmingly positive um, and just very interesting from like an anthropological study um, point of view. And so I I always feel like sex work in general, when depicted in uh, contemporary culture, kind of doesn't um, really get kind of uh, a fair shake. I feel like a lot of the nuances is lost. I think a lot of like, you know, I have the utmost respect for sex workers because beyond even the physical labor of like having to like jerk someone off which like who who wants to jerk someone off it's like the worst thing ever they have they have to like do so much emotional labor for you and like make you feel seen make you feel heard not make you feel judged it really takes a certain kind of person with like empathy and patience to really inhabit that also like I just think it's a really really interesting relationship because it feels at times very vulnerable and very personal and very warm while also being entirely transactional. And it's very, very easy to get those two things confused. Um, You're almost like, sometimes you're like, wow, you're like, must be a really good actor or something. I don't know. (laughs) And so I thought it was a perfect kind of vehicle for the character of Elliot, because I also think, I also think it's, it kind of mirrors my own relationship with, with using kind of erotic massage, which is that, it started off as very empowering. It was a way for me to explore feeling desirable and sexual without fear of judgment because I was paying this person. So it, in essence, I was in control. There wasn't really a fear of rejection, which um, has been a fear that I've had that's been paralyzing for the last, you know, whatever, but since the beginning of my life, since I was aware of having a dick, you know, and uh, 
And so, and it's only one that I recently got it over, but I think what's really interesting is that it's an arrangement that starts off really empowering for Elliot um, because I think it is empowering for him to be with someone who meets him where he is rather than him always having to meet his partner where he is. Um, but it, it kind of snowballs into this kind of romantic obsession, which is the part that obviously I don't really relate to. Um, and him kind of wanting to somehow uh, pierce the professional walls and become more than just a client and hoping and praying that maybe River would see beyond this and want to be with him for free, which is a very kind of sad thing to want, but I think just speaks to where Elliot is in his life. And I think, I think beyond even just the river of it all, I think when he sees other sex workers, it becomes this sort of compulsion and some sort of addiction. So kind of what becomes, what starts off as like this empowering kind of exploration of his sexuality and desirability, it actually becomes to represent all of his worst fears and triggers, which is that this person's only with me because I'm being paid, you know, I'm paying them. It, you know, it, it, it was originally the safeguard against rejection, but then it embodies rejection, if that makes sense. Right. You know right. what I mean? Yeah, that does make sense. And, but do you think like, it seems from the way that sex workers are portrayed in your work and, and they're mm -hmm. so, it's so warm, and there's also a lot of positive experiences. Do you feel like for yourself, you know, you were yeah. saying that it, um, it helped you work through, or you kind of were dealing with this fear of rejection. Do you mm -hmm. feel like ultimately it actually was positive? Like it helped you work through some of that anxiety um, and trauma? Sort of. Yes and no. I, I think like, I think when it started out initially, absolutely. But the biggest lesson I had to learn for myself, and I only learned it in the last year, was that it's okay to be rejected. It's okay to put yourself out there and have someone not want to fuck you. The world is not going to end if someone doesn't want to fuck you. And for so long, someone not wanting to fuck me would be so catastrophic and so demoralizing and it would just reinforce every negative thing I feel about myself in terms of feeling desirable and sexual that it would catapult me into, into despair. And I really had a real perspective shift this last year, which I'm so fucking grateful for, I swear to God, which is that like, it's really important to put yourself out there, make yourself vulnerable, and you learn so much from the people that don't want to fuck you. <laughs> and, it's, and it's okay. And it's yeah. okay. Someone not wanting to fuck you is not the end of the world. It's not a value judgment on you as a person. I mean, you know what I mean? And basically, like TLDR, it's not that deep. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> And oh that's, sort of a, that's sort of a mantra I have. It's like TLDR, it's not that deep. You know what I mean? <laughs> you sound very Gen Z, to be honest. But, um, I know, I've been hanging out with a lot of Gen Z. It's not like that deep? Really it's not um, that deep. TK, but, IDK? <laughs> but, um, oh my God, it's so true. I remember at one point, I mean, it's hard, like, it's like easier to say than to do, but <laughs> I feel like I have been able to do this a lot in my life. The moment that I realized, like, if you ask someone out and they reject you, you didn't lose anything because you're just back where you were. So there's like, you literally have nothing to lose by putting yourself out there and not having it work out. And it's also just like a numbers game. It's like, eventually someone's yeah. going to say yes. So it's like a net positive. Yeah, I think, I think, no, totally. And I think what made it so Herbie fully loaded for me was that like, I felt like every rejection was somehow a reinforcement of society's view of disabled people. Yeah. And it carried everything just carried it way, way, way too much weight. Do you know what I mean? And uh, but that part is real. I mean, that part is real. Like, like, you know, society doesn't really view disabled people as sexual, like as sexual beings. Like that, that's all very true. But again, like a rejection doesn't necessarily like doesn't need to carry the weight of societal prejudices towards a group of people. Do you know what I mean? Mm hmm. Um, yeah. So part of what the character of Elliot is going through in the book is this sort of idea of where he has, I guess, what will be called internalized ableism. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I mean, this is sort of touches on what you're talking about. And this feels like something where I imagine as a disabled person, it's like, you're not supposed to say that, you know? Yeah. Well, I mean, yeah. I mean, I, Look, 
internalized ableism, just like internalized misogyny, internalized homophobia, you know, you know, when you are taught to hate yourself and who you are, it's very, very easy and natural to project that hate onto people that remind you of yourself and the thing that you're trying to erase. Like that's very much like one plus one equals two, right? Mm -hmm. And, you know, growing up, I wanted nothing more than to like throw my cerebral palsy into a dumpster and be like XOXO. Um, and I remember, I even remember in high school, this really hot gay deaf guy, like when it asked me out on MySpace and I was like, ew, sick. Like I would never be with him. He's deaf, you know? And then a part of me was like, does he think he has a chance with me just because I'm disabled? Because like, really, like I'm not even that disabled and like he can literally like go fuck himself. Like, da -da -da. like it was just like so problematica, like truly. And anything that represented my disability was like, like an itchy wool sweater that I need to get off my body like immediately. So the idea, like, and it, it's so funny because also like, you know, to this day, you know, I definitely know a lot more disabled people than I did before special. And I've had, you know, that, that show has brought a lot of amazing disabled people into my life, but I still don't have that like crew of people. You know what I mean? I don't have those like really close friends that are disabled and da, 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 which is, you know, it like does a number on you. I mean, imagine like not being friends with any women, you know what I mean? Like, it's sort of like, okay. Um, so, you know, I thought it would be really interesting to kind of do a story where, you know, we have a disabled love interest because with someone who's been struggling with his own disability, because by allowing himself to love this person, you know, spoilers, but whatever, um, he's by extension letting himself fall in love with himself. Do you know what I mean? Right. Which I thought was just a very powerful kind of tool. You know what I mean? I feel like probably, I mean, do you hear a lot of, have you heard a lot of people, disabled people say that in the past where it's almost like you want to get an able-bodied partner, even if you can't admit that out loud? Yeah. I mean, I, I think, I mean, I'm sure, I'm sure that some people feel that way. I'm sure that you know, because of enterprise ableism, getting an able-bodied partner somehow feels like winning a prize, you know? It feels like, oh, I'm, I'm deserving of an able-bodied able love interest. Da, da, da. Like, I'm sure that a lot of those kind of toxic thoughts run through people's heads. I mean, I never, you know, my boyfriend is able-bodied, um, although I swear to God, he's like the clumsiest able-bodied person ever. I swear to God, he like literally runs. It's almost like a sitcom <laughs> where like he like he's so clumsy, dumsy. He like falls like all the time. He like bumps into things. I'm like, honey, I'm disabled. Like like literally like I <laughs> stop trying to stop trying to yeah stop trying to like co co op my existence. Okay, <laughs> problematic matcha. Appropriation. Um, yeah, exactly. Appropriation. Stop fucking bumping into walls. Okay, that's my thing. <laughs> um, but it's so interesting because I think, I think I do have a curiosity like towards queer disabled people just as friends or lovers or whatever. I think because it's like, I just never have spent that much time with someone who reminds me of myself in that way. I mean, there are exceptions of course, but so it's definitely an area of my life that I'm kind of, uh, interested in and I think probably use the book as a way to explore it without actually exploring it because we were in lockdown and <laughs> couldn't go outside. <laughs> well I feel like it's just articulating stuff and having people read it and be like oh my god that's my experience I'm too embarrassed or ashamed to say that out loud is really significant like cliche cliche visibility matters but I think that that's yeah true. Well by the way any any marginalized population aka anyone that's not a straight white guy can relate to that because like how many women have you met that's like you know what I just like don't hang out with girls there's so much drama there's just too much drama and like honestly I'm just like a guy's girl and I just like hang out with guys like that's who I am you know what I mean like girl, like girls are just too much and then like you meet a gay guy that's like oh you know like obviously you know you go on grinder it's like no fats no femmes no agents or whatever so there's plenty of prejudice and racism and all that stuff there so it's like I don't think you even need to be disabled to understand what it means to want to erase this part of yourself that society deems, you know, not desirable or unfit. Like, I think like, again, anyone that's not a straight white guy can relate to that idea. You know what I mean? Yeah, like literally, I mean, I do it too. I mean, I'm not someone who I think of as like being sexist or whatever, but, and I have lots, you know, many, many women in my life who I think are amazing and 
but just to preface the fact that the other day I was driving and like this woman cut me off and I literally had the thought without thinking like, oh my God, women can't drive. Oh my God, hello. You're like, Carly, the call's coming from inside the house. I know. And then I was like, why would I say that? Like, I'm a good driver. And then it's like, am I? Like, as I like accidentally back into a pole. Hello, hello. You're like, like, take away their licenses. Take away. I know. No, it's true. I mean, I, look, we all, we all have these ugly thoughts that creep up, you know what I mean? And I think it's because it's baked into our subconscious, you know what I mean? It's like societal conditioning. And I think like the best you can do is just be aware of them and not give them any power. You know, I, I, I've said before, but like internalized ableism is like carbon monoxide. Like we're all breathing it in and it's all poisoning us whether we realize it, like when we don't even realize it, it's just in the air, you know what I mean? For sure. Um, it's in the air. Uh, so, okay, so I wanted to talk about alcohol, um, sure. because it's my passion. No, I mean, kind of, but like, uh, when you, I remember when we were, um, you know, talking over COVID and you were yeah. writing this book, you were also getting sober, right? Yes. I, uh, I got sober halfway through writing the book. Yeah. Oh my God. Really? Halfway? Yeah. So halfway. Weird. I know, but I kind of felt like I was casting a spell, like I was a witch, and I was like, once I admit these things to myself through, vis-a-vis the character of Elliot, I will never be able to unsee it. Like, it's like, it's truly like all these things that I've been too embarrassed to admit about my own relationship with alcohol, I really put all of those feelings into Elliot. And, and yeah. having it laid out so clearly and succinctly, like there was no avoiding it anymore. Like, what could I do? It's right there. And I was so, I was so relieved, but also very ashamed, you know what I mean? To really be admitting to myself for the first time, just how bad my problem had gotten. Um, But it was great because it really, it got me sober. And I don't think I would have gotten, I mean, it's weird. It's like between the pandemic and my drinking just escalating naturally through the pandemic and then writing this book, like, I think those were the two forces that really got me sober. It's very interesting though, to think about what I, if I would be sober, if it wasn't for the pandemic, if it wasn't for writing this book, because I don't really know, because I was so high functioning, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And like the way I drank, like, like, again, like all I knew was kind of what everybody knows, which is like, you're either an alcoholic or you're not. And like being an alcoholic is really bad. And like, if you're an alcoholic, you're going to be like, literally like fucking things up and like destroying your life and like, like like, sleeping in hungover and like missing a meeting and like losing your job and your friends are going to be worried about you. And so like, I was like, okay, well, I drink like three to four drinks every night and I just like have a mid-grade hangover every single day that is like manageable. And so like, what is my rock bottom? And like, <laughs> what, like you know what I mean? I was like, literally like, I was like, the, the scary thing about my life is like the way I drink, I could see myself doing it for the rest of my life with no quote unquote visible problems. Mm-hmm. And that was the most bone chilling to me because I knew myself and I knew that I don't know if I would ever get to a place that would look like intervention. Like, I just don't think I would because I'm so, I'm so, like, you know what I mean? I'm so driven. I'm so, I'm such a fucking Virgo. Like, I just don't think I had it in me. And so that created this sort of, um, this lost feeling of being like, well, how, how can I quit? Because alcohol is so sewn into the fabric of our culture that really you only need to quit again if things have if check these boxes you know what I mean it's like it's so binary the language around drinking is so so binary yeah and I think it keeps people from interrogating their own relationship with alcohol and I think you know what I realized through reading this naked mind by Annie Grace which is what the book that Elliot reads uh is that you know most people exist in a gray area and, you know, they wouldn't technically fit the bill of what an alcoholic looks like, or, you know, she doesn't even use the term alcoholic. She just says addicted to alcohol because it's an addictive substance and like, LOL, like spoiler alert. Like if you do an addictive substance, you can get addicted. It's not even about, and also people are so obsessed with like, you know, alcoholism doesn't run my family. So I'm fine. You know, it's all genetic. It's all genetic. It's this, it's that. It's like, no, babe, like literally anyone can get addicted to drinking. It's like really not that complicated. But again, I think, I think we like to think of it as something that couldn't happen to us. Um, And I also think compared to like my addiction to painkillers, which TBH painkillers are so much better than alcohol. That was so clear cut. That was so like, wow, I took like four Roxy before this lunch at the Odeon. And now I'm nodding off into my frisee salad. Like, that's not good. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like that was like, so like clear cut, like, Oh honey, sweetie baby. That's like not normal. Or like, 
I'm like, or I just, oh, rats, I puked up my rock, my Roxy set. And now I'm dope sick all weekend and I can't go to dinner with my friend. <laughs> like, I, I was like, I was very yeah, like, red oh, flags. Yeah, red flags. Whereas again, compared to drinking, it was again, it was like, I'm having three to four cocktails a night at dinner with friends. I'm getting drunk, but like, I'm waking up, I'm exercising, I'm going to my job and like everything is quote unquote fine. You know what I mean? And I think, I just think that there, the language around alcohol and how much power it has over our culture and how kind of anyone is susceptible. I just think that the, the narrative needs to shift and people need to be having more nuanced discussions around drinking and think more critically about drinking and the role that it plays in our lives. No, I totally get what you mean. I mean, that that the representation that we think of in terms of an alcoholic is like someone who has a bottle of vodka yes. in bed and drinks. And Drinking at work. Yeah, yeah. totally. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And, mm-hmm. but so many of us are so dependent on it. And I remember before, before, you know, you were saying I have three or four cocktails a night out with friends. And I yeah. feel like before the pandemic, I was like, oh, I don't have a problem with alcohol because I'm just like a social drinker. I drink when I'm out. You know what I right. mean? Like, I drink at home alone. Right. And then the pandemic happened and I was like, oh, I don't drink at home alone because like I'm never home at night. I go out every no, night. No, totally. So- well, by, by the way, by the way, me and I have this rule where I was like, I'm not going to drink at home ever again. And I didn't do it for a year, but guess what I did? I drew, I went out every single oh night God. for a year. Yeah. I, 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 LOL. Loophole, I, loophole, loophole, loophole. Yeah. Then the pandemic started and I was like, oh no, I'm really good at drinking all alone. I just never had the option before. Cause I had yeah, like, cause our social calendars were so busy. I know. Do you think that, um, like, how was your life different? I mean, maybe this is sort of like a broad question, but yeah. how is your life different now that you're not drinking? Oh my God. Oh, I love this. I love this. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Well, besides being hot and like literally 30 pounds heavier, which I'm sorry, uh, that's like just for me personally, <laughs> but I mean, you know, no, nothing wrong with, uh, yeah. Anyway. Um, but basically, um, you know, I think when I was drinking, I was a much more anxious person. Like I, when I had a hard day, when I had a stressful day, I would need some sort of release. I would need something to symbolize the end of the day to cut, like I would need a sort of separation. You know what I mean? And I was convinced that this is how I was wired. I'm an anxious person. I'm neurotic. This is who I am. I'm a writer. And since quitting drinking, I have found, and I've had very stressful moments since not drinking. It's been almost two years. Um, I have found I have no, I don't need a release. Like this anxiety and this stress, I'm not saying that I don't get anxious or stressed out, I do. But this need to solve it, to to get rid of it immediately, to, to get rid of it. Because that's what alcohol was for me. It was like literally like, it was like putting water out on a fire. But really that water was creating a bigger fire. You know what I'm saying? Because really what would happen is I would drink to relieve anxiety and then wake up hungover, and then my anxiety would grow times 10 because I was hungover and ill-equipped to deal with anything. It made me into a raw nerve. And I think when I have removed alcohol from the equation, I have been so shocked to find that I actually am not nearly as anxious or stressed out of a person as I thought I was. And that really was a creation from alcohol. You know what I mean? Like it kept me, and it kept me dependent on alcohol because I was like, oh, I can only be quote unquote normal and chilled out if I have a glass of wine. I can't, I can't achieve that on my own. I'm too, oh God, I'm wired too, I'm too high strung. You know what I mean? Which was an absolute fallacy created by my emotional dependency on drinking. You know what I mean? Completely. Like it makes you into a crazy person. And so you have to like use alcohol again to like calm the fuck down. Right. But like the thing that's making you into a crazy person is the alcohol. So you're just like caught in this like really boring washing machine that just like makes you not chic. You know what I mean? Yeah, I know. <laughs> it's true. Anyways, I'm like, yeah, you're right. But anyway, I'm not going to change. Um, <laughs> one day. Hopefully one day. So, no, and by, and by the way, like not like, uh, you know, like my boyfriend read This Naked Mind and he still drinks, but he drinks like he used to drink like, oh, well, maybe I shouldn't put him on blast, but he definitely used to drink to like relieve anxiety and stress. And, and now that he read This Naked Mind, he has truly become such a social drinker and like his drinking has like 
decreased significantly. And I think I think the goal of the book to me is not quitting drinking because not, not everyone needs to quit drinking. That's not really what this is about. It's yeah. really just about being mindful and kind of like breaking the spell that alcohol has on you. Because that's what it felt like to me. I felt like I was hypnotized by alcohol, you know, like under its under its gaze. And um, I think that's really just what the book does is it pierces that illusion. And I think that once that illusion is pierced, you don't really typically drink the same, you know what I mean? And you just drink more thoughtfully. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I remember from that book when you talk about it in your book too, one of the things that I took away was like, so you have to kind of erase this assumption in your brain that like alcohol makes things more fun. Yeah, yeah, this idea, like, exactly. And, 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 and by removing it, your life would somehow be less fun. It's again, it's it's like your brain, it's brainwashing because it's like, think about all the movies we watch, all the TV shows we watch where drinking has become synonymous with fun. And it's just not right. true. It's just not true. It's like, it's just like a fucking lie that we have been fed by pop from popular culture and just like by being a person in the world. And it ain't true. For sure. And it's definitely like the gateway to not like a gateway, but like it's a lube for sex for most people. Like I think like I was having yeah. this conversation the other day with a group of my friends and we were like, of course we've had, well, not of course, but we have had sex sober in our lives. But we were, we were like, have you ever had sex with somebody for the first time sober? And we were yeah. like, yeah, no, that, that is, that is the trickiest part. I think of being sober while also trying to mack on some dudes is that like, I have found that it's a blessing and a curse because a blessing in the sense that there have been guys where I'm like, Oh God, your personality is not the one. And like, if I was drunk, <laughs> if I was drunk, I wouldn't care. And I'd go home with you, but then I would regret it because I'd wake up next to Bozo the clown. So like in that sense, I'm, I'm grateful that like being sober has really made thing you know, things appear exactly as they are and there's no doling the edges uh it's definitely gotten me out of some probably experiences that I would regret but again culturally people when you don't drink when you're trying it's like people don't give themselves permission to be honest or be vulnerable or make a move unless they're inebriated and I think I think that it's like something that is just so sewn into the fabric of dating and sex and all that stuff and that has been a tricky thing because it's like well, I don't have any reservations about making a move sober because I'm sober, but everyone else needs to in order to to feel vulnerable, which is also kind of dark. You know what I mean? Yeah, and it's also like, if I'm really drunk, I can't come. So this isn't even good. Oh my God. There was this guy once that was like that. I mean, whatever. I'm glad it didn't work out. But he got like weakened at Bernie's Wasted. It was like through the course of the night. And it was like literally, he like finally made a move on me when he was like full on like an extra from The Walking Dead. And I was like, I literally was like, honey, you're like gonna die. Like I was like, I was like, like he's like, and he got like annoyed and angry at me for like not hooking up with him. And I was like, honey, you are truly like, you're gonna, you need to go into a, like an Uber immediately. I was like, this is so not like, cheap. I think this would literally be rape if I had sex with no, you. No, like, totally. It's like, yeah, totally. That's another thing where it's like, honey, but it's also like so not sexy. And it's like, and it yeah. like, it was like so clear that like, if I'd still been drinking, I would probably, I mean, I never got as drunk as this person was that night. But, uh, but I would be kind of like, ah, right, whatever. I'd be like, oh, this person's really drunk, but so am I. Like, let's go home. And it would have been such a flop. You know what I mean? Exactly. Literally. Ugh. Yeah. Anyway. Ugh, gross. So, but like flop, like penis, you're not getting my joke. No, I got, oh, honey. Flop, you <laughs> not, oh, honey. I'm not getting I, my bad joke. No, I get it. I get it. Very, okay. Um, okay. So, okay. There's a couple questions from the okay. audience before we go. Okay. So here's a question. Um, from Allison, how do you compare script writing to writing a novel or memoir? Um, okay, so script writing, oh, that's so interesting. So writing a novel is much more, in a way, creatively liberating because like obviously like story needs to have plot, there's the basics of structure, but I don't know, honey, have you read some of the novels out lately? I'm like, wow, nothing happens. Um, but like, it's a but mood. like, yeah, it's a mood. Like it's a true, true mood. And by the way, some movies are like this too. Like some movies are just like, oh, this is a vibe, not a mood. Like, you know, this is like clearly just a vibe, period, end of story. Yeah. But generally I have found script writing to be 
like doing a math equation. Like it really is like you're setting up X, Y, and Z to pay this off later. You're going to set the like, you know what I mean? So it becomes very, very, very one plus one equals two, which can feel, I mean, it can be great and amazing, but it can also feel like, wow, there really is, I'm beholden to this formula. And again, you can always buck convention, whatever, whatever. But in my experience, like the novel is much less restrictive and you really can just kind of do whatever you want, dot, 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 dot. Like, I don't know. And it's also just like, when you write a script, it's so collaborative. Like there's a million people weighing in, weighing in. And when it's good, when you have smart collaborators, it's incredible. When it's when you're working with idiots, it can be really demoralizing. And whereas a, a memoir is really just, or a book, a novel is really just you, your agent, and your editor. So to me, not to sound pretentious, but it's very much, it's a more pure distillation of you as an artist. It's because there's just not that many people weighing in. You know what I mean? And it feels very, very intimate. So um, I loved it. I mean, I don't see myself writing another one unless <laughs> I, I had something to say, like I had with this one. Like this was very clearly, like I had a lot of things to work through as a person. And I was grappling with a lot of demons, clearly like getting sober, blah, blah, blah. And so I needed to write it to like save my life basically. And I don't foresee myself like, doing that again until something horrible happens <laughs> right wow no yeah. um just kidding like <laughs> but okay I'm writing a novel I'm sure super hard writing books I wrote one I'm never gonna write it again because spoiler alert they're very long and I hate well, wait as- what do you what do you mean so you would never write a novel I don't know I've thought about it but I'm just like oh my god books are so but Carly Carly you didn't read my book because you and I I feel like we are similar like our voice like we're very voicey we're very like whatever like you didn't read this and be like oh I could write like I don't know do you know what I'm saying because like, I'm not like a novel bitch anyway but I just wrote my version of a novel I, I had this one thought like at, when I was reading your book I was like oh I think I could probably do this and then I got to another part that was really good and I was like no I can't oh my it. god you so could do this because your <laughs> book was so incredible and it's so freeing to like I don't know it's like you don't have to like again be beholden to the truth you can be as real as you want to be and also can I just say and this is the very cynical part of me we live in a town that is absolutely bankrupt and spineless and all they care about is IP so you, yeah, can write yeah. a, you can write a book, get paid for it, and then you can get paid to write the screenplay. Like, just by look, I'm going to be really savage. Just by looking at him, if I had just written it as a movie, I don't think would ever have gotten made, truly. And because there was a novel and people understood what I was trying to do, like, it, it got, you know, optioned immediately, and now it's being adapted into a movie. I really think it would have been a much, much harder road had I not written the book first. For sure. It is like, it feels like the long cut, but I sometimes it's like the only way, you know? Yeah, kind of. You're like, it would be like faster for you to like write a novel, get it adapted and make it a movie rather than just like write a screenplay. Like it truly would be faster. Yeah. Something, I mean, I've written short stories and something I think is really funny about it, you know, going back to the question, the difference between screenwriting and, and writing fiction. And I started writing scripts before I ever wrote like a short story or anything. And, you know, you get the whole kind of, the whole idea of it is like show, don't tell, right? Right. If Mm -hmm. someone is feeling conflicted about whether they should quit their job or whatever. Right. Meet this character, you have to see an action. They have to be doing something that like makes you as the audience be like, oh my God, this person seems like they're maybe really conflicted. Where in a book, you can just be like internal dialogue, like, oh my God, I'm so (laughs) conflicted about whether I should... (laughs) <laughs> like, totally, like, totally. But you can just do that that's crazy it's true it's really really true I mean like you know my stuff is so voicey for better or for worse but like mm-hmm. I cannot imagine me like just writing a book about you know some like maudlin widow living in Pittsburgh like I, I you know I think whatever I do will always feel like sort of like it came from me again that's like the like the blessing it, it is kind of a blessing and a curse having a distinct voice because I feel like as I get older, you know, I've been in my queer disabled era the last three or four years with special queer folk just mm-hmm. by looking at it, the book and now the movie. And now I'm kind of like, okay, like what next? And like, wow, like I would love it if it wasn't just like from my diary, 
You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And but it's hard because I know that my voice is really specific, which can be a huge strength. But like when branching out into other things, it can be a little nerve wracking. So you're like, you're like, oh well, will it sound too much like me? You know what I mean? Do you ever do? Because you, you also have a very voicey voice. You have a very unique voice, very specific voice. Do you ever worry about that in your writing at all? Yeah, I do. Well, I worry about like I feel like recently I had a experience that I think is maybe similar to what you're saying, where I was like. I write from my own experience so much, but then I feel like I've gotten to the point where I'm like, well, I'm sick of myself. Yeah. Yeah. No, totally. Yeah. And these things like, like we were talking about processing your own experiences, your own feelings, yourself, your life through your writing is helpful. But then after a while you're like, okay, I got it. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. And sometimes, you know, I've been like writing, developing something, um, whatever about this group of young girls and, sometimes I can feel like, wait, am I being, am I like a fraud or something? Or is this like, uh, it's almost like, is this really, like is this person real? It's almost like people don't seem real or authentic or like I did a good enough job if I haven't right. like, actually experienced it. So I yes. think it, there's gotta be a way around around this problem. <laughs> yeah, no, and I, I think, you know, and it's like, we, you, you've you also, you know, you, you wrote on, um, you know, um, now Apocalypse and co-created that so you know like you've written other characters voices that aren't you so like and I've written for other tv shows so like I know intellectually like I've done it before I've written for a variety of different characters but there is sort of this like weird almost like embarrassment I feel sometimes being like oh but like my voice is the strong I don't know whatever anyway it's, uh, <laughs> it's, uh, Anyways, yeah. anyway um I think we're being summoned to end this <laughs> Oh, yeah, okay. Yes. Even though I could talk to you forever, Ryan. Oh, and you will. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks so you much, have no, you have no choice. This is um, so, I hated to pop in because I don't want to end it, but I did have one other question. Can you just tell me the cover is fabulous? We love it here at the bookstore. Can you just talk about it for two seconds? Yeah. Oh my God. Can I tell you like, the real story behind it? Yes, please. Okay. So originally we wanted to get a Hockney and we, but we needed to put this sticker over the butt because uh, <laughs> apparently like places literally would not sell the book if we had like a butt. And it was the famous Hockney painting of this guy coming out of a pool and you see his ass Yeah. and Hockney would not clear it if, if a novel was obscuring the butt. So they would not approve it. They would approve yeah. it. If, yeah. So then we went with this photo, which I think <clears throat> symbolizes the same vibe and is very moody and melancholy and queer. And now I'm addicted to it. And now I'm like, I can't imagine it being anything else. Um, I'm obsessed with it. It's great. Yeah. And it's funny because the UK version of the book is like, basically hot pink and it's like a, all these men's legs entangled with each other no and I love it it's like so horny and raunchy it feels like <laughs> it feels kind of like a difference it's it feels like very emblematic of like the difference of cultures which is like yes. this book, but like hi it's it it's like call me by your name it's emotional totally. <laughs> and then the British are just like yeah it's cocks it's cocks lots of cocks <laughs> you know what I mean Oh my God. I love it so much. You guys, I'm serious. This was such an incredible conversation. I just love how open and wonderful it was. And you guys should just do a podcast together and talk oh, about all this stuff. Don't, don't threaten us with it. We're, we're too, we're too bored people in Los Angeles. Don't threaten yeah. us with the podcast. Seriously. It would be amazing. So I want to thank you. I want to thank our audience. And I just want to, where's my book? Oh, here you guys, we have um, a signed book plate in all our books that we have. You can purchase yeah. it through um, online at Book Passage. You can come into our stores because we are open. You can call us and have a copy or two or three sent to you. But but I want to highly, highly recommend this for anyone. It's fabulous. And we just feel so fortunate that you guys were here. Um, thank you. I'll, for- I'll come in. I'll come in when I go to SF and I'll sign some more or whatever. Oh, or, or thank I, you. Or I can personalize some of them more because I've, yeah, anyway. Okay. Yeah, well, I, I want you in. to personalize one for me. So make sure yes. I'm here. <laughs> I will. I will. Thank All you right. so much. Thank you guys so much. Thank Thanks you. everybody. That was Bye. Bye-bye.